My name is Mari Margill. I work um, actually way out in Portland, Oregon um, for the Legal Defense Fund. Um, and We're a public interest law firm, um, and we began back in 1995 to assist communities in Pennsylvania where we're headquartered and based. And we were to assist them um, to do a lot of the things I think some of you have been engaged with, which is communities facing an unwanted landfill, perhaps an incinerator, working with these communities to assist them to work within the environmental regulatory system, which is put together by our states, which give permits for corporations to do certain kinds of business in our communities, whether it is setting up a landfill, putting up a big box store, or withdrawing your water. And what we did for the first couple of years um, since we formed was actually assist those communities to navigate their way through the regulatory system. And what does that mean? It means appealing the permits that the state was issuing to the different corporations to operate in these communities. And so we would assist these communities to appeal these permits. So we would go to, the, we'd go to great lengths to find why these permits were insufficient, why they weren't complete, why the state shouldn't be approving them. And through the process of that, we would go to court and we'd get judges to throw out those permits because we find all sorts of holes and omissions in them all sorts of things that were wrong with them that the corporation hadn't completed. And we would win because we would show up, number one, which most communities can't even afford to do, um, because it's so expensive to hire a, a lawyer <coughs> to come in and help protect your community. And we were offering free legal services, and so we would help these communities um, without charging them anything. So you can imagine that we had a lot of communities knocking at our door. And we would go to different, we'd go and assist these communities to appeal these permits, and most often we would win. We would win because the corporations doesn't complete everything, and they'd put a bond that wasn't the right amount, or they had the wrong signature on the form, or whatever it might be. Not the substance, but really more the process um, of the application itself would be in, insufficient. And so we would win. The community would say, the system works. We got this thing thrown out because it's not the right thing for our community. And then ultimately what would happen is the corporation would come back with a more complete permit application and the facility would get to be cited. And so while we would have a wonderful win-loss record in court and getting these permit applications thrown out, ultimately the corporation could come back because the law allowed them to, to put in a more complete new and improved application and they would get that application approved and be able to cite their facility. And so what happens, which is the community goes through this whole process and they do all of the things, all of the things that Gail is referring to that Nottingham went through, which I know some of you have been going through, which is getting the permits, I'm, I'm sorry, getting petitions signed, holding signs, organizing and educating your neighbors, appealing to your state legislators, appealing to your town officials, appealing to your water district, using the media to try to tell your story, all of the right things that we do in our activism but weren't enough. All of the right things, but they're not enough. And why aren't they enough? Well, it took us a little while to figure it out, too. And so we did this for a couple of years, and we found out that our communities were losing. They were losing because they were getting the thing that they didn't want, and they're getting the harm to their environment, the harm to their local economy, their harm to their local agriculture, their harm to their local culture. Why wasn't this working? So we took a big step back to take a look at what we were doing, and we took a look at the way that the regulatory system works, and we just took a long time to figure out who does it actually work for and what's its purpose. And what we determined was, is looking at the structure of law as a whole, the regulatory system, our constitutional structure of law, how it's structured its history, and we talk a lot about this in our democracy schools, a lot about how the structure of law came to be, the history of why it is and the way that it is today, why it works and who it operates for. And what we determined was that the environmental regulatory system is actually put together for the purpose of allowing these things to come into your community, to regulate those activities so that they can actually come into your community. And no one tells the communities that are trying to fight them that they literally, legally, do not have the authority to say no to them that they don't have the legal authority to say no. But under our structure of law, you don't have the legal authority to say no to a company like Nestle coming in and taking your water. No matter how hard you fight, no matter if you do all of the right things in your activism, you don't have the power to say no. That was news to us. That explained why these communities were losing. And so what happens is, it's really interesting. I did a lot of corporate accountability work, which Carol explained in her introduction, which we try to pressure corporations from stopping to do things that we think are wrong. And it wasn't the things that were illegal that we were trying to stop corporations from doing. It was what they were doing legally 
that we were trying to stop them from doing. So they can legally come into your communities and take your water. They can legally come in and set up factory farms, which destroy your local farms. They can legally come in and do these things because our state allows them to come in and be able to do these things. And they have what's called corporate constitutional rights and protection, which Gail alluded to. And these which came through past 150 years of jurisprudence, which allowed corporations, in addition to having the structure of law, the regulatory structure of law, which allows them to come into your community to set up these facilities, they also have this body of corporate constitutional rights and privileges, rights that were initially put into place to protect our rights as people under law. Corporations use those powers against communities, so they can threaten to sue you, saying that you violated our corporate constitutional rights. And what does that do to a community? We've seen it hundreds of times. When a corporation threatens to come in and sue you as a community, you, your local elected officials, you as activists, which they can threaten to do as well, you can imagine what that does to a community. It chills all kinds of activism. People don't, people don't want to be sued. Why would you want to be sued? And so corporations have these powers which they're able to use in conjunction with the state to override your ability to make decisions about what happens in your community. And we see it all over the country every single day in which communities want to say no. They want to say no to their water being taken. They want to say no to factory farms coming in. They want to say no to sludge, like Barnes had tried to say no to sludge. But they don't. They can't because they don't have the power under the law to say no. And even when they try to say no, corporations come in and try to chill their activism. And so understanding how that structure of law worked, we changed the way that we do our work. It's how we became engaged with the community of Barnstead and Nottingham, beginning in communities in Pennsylvania, which were facing incinerators and sludge and factory farms and mining, in which we, they determined they cannot say no under the structure of law. And so we changed the way we did our work. We no longer appealed the permits. We no longer worked inside that regulatory structure because we understood it did not provide remedy to the communities. It didn't allow them to protect their communities from these things coming in. And so instead, we turned our back to it and began to work with these communities to put into law ordinances which do several things. Number one, they say communities can't, the corporations cannot engage in water withdrawals here, or corporations cannot engage in factory farming here, or putting up incinerators here, or mining here. So putting a ban on the corporations being able to do that in their community, saying no to that, seizing the local self-governing authority and saying no. They do something else. Because those corporations use their constitutional rights to override community decision making, they also eliminate certain corporate constitutional rights, so the corporations can't use those to undermine that law which says no to water withdrawals. And then they do something else, so those are the first two things they do. And now about a dozen communities, including Barnstead, have now done something in addition to that, which is to put into place what we call rights of nature or ecosystem rights, which give inalienable rights to ecosystems to exist and to thrive. Um, and there's about a dozen communities in three states that now have now adopted that. And what it does, it also gives people within the community the ability to stand in the shoes of the ecosystem, in this case aquifers or rivers or whatever it might be, to stand in the place of that ecosystem in order to be able to protect it. Because I heard um, folks talking about not having standing before the court, not having standing to be able to protect these things which you, which you rely upon, which are integral to your community and to your ecosystems. What Rights of Nature does is actually give you automatic standing as a member of that community to be able to protect those ecosystems should they be violated. Um, and that's where we went to Ecuador earlier this year to actually work with the people in Ecuador as they wrote a new constitution and in that new constitution, they were very concerned in the course of the writing of that with multinational corporations coming in, many of them, of course, from the United States, coming in and doing things like mining or drilling for oil and destroying ecosystems, destroying the rainforest, destroying the Amazon. And so they were tired of that, as you can imagine, um, and corporations coming in and using their ecosystems as a cheap hotel. They wanted to stop that. And so they looked at some of the communities in the United States that had done something different, communities like Barnstead, which said, we are protecting and we're recognizing the inalienable rights of ecosystems in our community. And so as of the end of September, through a national referendum, the people of Ecuador actually voted in, in their new constitution, that ecosystems there have the right to exist, to thrive, and evolve. They're the first country in the world to base their protection for the environment on rights, on rights, rather than the idea of environment and ecosystems being property, being property under the law, which is how we treat 
um, ecosystems in the United States today. We treat them as property under the law, which is if you own them, you can destroy them. And that's, I'll leave it there.